All right. Well, thanks everyone so much for joining us today in, in another June Water Talk. And today we're going to be talking about improving your clean water quality with new UDF functionalities. And today it's not just myself, it's going to be myself and my two colleagues, Nathan and Susanna. So I'm Yusuf Alfaheim, a water enthusiast and a solutions engineer with Autodesk. And I'll pass it on to Nathan to give this you know, a little yeah. bit of a yeah, yeah. My name's Nathan. Uh, I've I've uh, been on a number of these water talks. I've been with Innovise for for seven years now, uh, coming through through support and helping with sales. And now now I'm the product manager. So I work with the development teams on InfoWater Pro and our other water distribution products. So happy to happy to to join. Um, get to share with the audience uh, just some things that we we've, we've been working on. So um, over to you, Susanna. Yes, uh, my name is Susana Betts. I've also been part of Innovise for uh, several years now. I currently work as a software QA engineer, specifically for the InfoWater uh, and InfoWater Pro desktop products. And um, yeah, I'm excited to uh, yeah, to be part of this water talk today. Cool. So before we move on, actually, so Nathan and Susanna have a ton of experience with this stuff. This is actually my first water talk. And I'm going to request that if you would like, if you can give me a thumbs up through the Zoom reactions, that would be great. Hopefully I get a few thumbs ups. Let's see if uh, we can get some coming in here, please. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Keep the energy. <laughs> Look, you can see us. We can't see you. So we always love you to be engaged with us and, you know, be active. Show some love. Show thumbs up. We're happy to take that any day. With that, we're going to move on to just some things that we need to mention uh, in each water talk. Primarily the goal of the water talks is really to establish a community for us modelers to interact, talk about things and to knowledge share. A few things that, that we wanna highlight in our Zoom platform is the difference between the Q&A and the chat tabs. The chat is gonna be for discussions amongst attendees and between any of us and the attendees. The Q&A is what we're gonna be using to read and address questions. So any questions that get thrown in the chat, we're not gonna be able to answer those. So if you have any questions that you'd like answered, please make sure you're using the Q&A tab in the platform. And just a, a, a little bit of a look ahead, in July, we're gonna have two water talks, one uh, revolving around info drainage on July 12th, solving common drainage design problems. And then end of July, July 26th, we're gonna be covering the advantages of using GIS data within your model, which is primarily in InfoWater Pro. And then early August, we're going to have a session, a water talk on Info360 Insight. With that. Uh, Yusuf, did, did you cover the most common question we always get on whether or not this will be recorded? Good point, actually. I did not. So this session will be recorded and all of you will have access to it through the same Zoom link that was sent to you, the same webinar link. And it's going to be available within 24 hours, correct? Yep. Awesome. So let's get rolling. So today's agenda is shown on the screen. We're going to start with a brief introduction to flushing, and then we're going to get into an InfoWater Pro UDF demo. Finally, we're going to cover some tips and tricks and QA, QC tools available to you within InfoWater Pro. And we're going to wrap it up with a, a Q&A session uh, to address any of your questions that you might have. So introduction to flushing. What is flushing? Well, in simple terms, flushing is the opening of hydrants or blow-offs to improve your distribution system water quality. Generally speaking, they're part of a systematic uh, you know, utility-wide program. However, they can be in response to customer complaints. And when we talk about flushing, there have been some rules of thumb that have been established, and that is primarily to flush from the source and then go out in your distribution system, and also to flush with clean water behind you. So that's a little bit of what flushing is. And now we can talk about why it even matters, right? Why are we talking about flushing today? Why do utilities need to use flushing as a tool? So it's primarily for water quality and water quality is an umbrella that, that covers many things from water age to removing deposits and sediment buildup. And when we say 
deposits and se sediment buildup, they can be from precipitate chemical precipitation, they can be from corrosion, and they can be biological from biofilm. A another benefit or importance of flushing is they can help you improve your disinfectant residual. So areas they, that may have stagnant water and low residual, when you flush, you're able to bring fresh water in to increase your uh, chlorine residuals. And then finally, they can help utilities solve taste, odor, discoloring, and turbidity problems that customers may be facing. Today, we're gonna pretty much, you know, put flushing into two categories, conventional and unidirectional. There are some textbooks that, you know, further break down flushing into other categories, but for the sake of this webinar, we're only gonna be covering and comparing conventional versus UDF, unidirectional flushing. With conventional flushing, it's pretty much, you're out in the distribution system, you open a hydrant and you keep it open until the water runs clear. So as you're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen, you're pretty much having flow coming in through various pipes in your distribution systems and your velocities are rather low between, you know, it can be about maybe one to two, maybe two and a half max, uh, you know, depending on your, your pipe diameters and, and your distribution system. But UDF, on the other hand, it's more controlled. You're pretty much forcing the flow to go through a specific route in order to maximize your velocities. So here you're, you're isolating water mains and you're closing off valves in order to direct all the flow through the high, you know, out of that hydrant through specific water mains that you're targeting. More comparisons between conventional versus UDF. With conventional flush flushing, you're gonna see significantly lower velocities compared to your UDF where you might go up to you know, the six to seven range and maybe 10 uh, feet, per, feet per second if your distribution system allows for it. Uh, with conventional, it's pretty much uncontrolled uh, flow direction, which can be risky if you disturb areas that may have sediment, but if you, you, you disturb them and you keep that water in your pipes. For, for instance, you open a hydrant that disturbs an area, of, you know, a little bit upstream, and then you don't keep that hydrant open enough to actually take out the water that you disturb. So there's a risk with a little bit of a risk with conventional flushing compared to UDF where you're pretty much knowing or controlling the flow direction. So you're able to maximize the areas that are successfully cleaned. A, another comparison is conventional flushing is primarily only able to remove your loose sediment. However, UDF can remove your loose sediment your attached deposits and biofilm. And this is because you're able to, you know, hit the shear stresses from maximizing your velocities in your pipes. And there were several research articles and studies and textbooks that talk about the benefits of UDF over conventional flushing that it requires less water. So when you have more controlled flow and you're able to hit higher velocities, you're able to save water through a UDF program compared to flushing. Finally, another, another key differentiator you know, between UDF and conventional is UDF allows you to proactively test valves and hydrants, which can you know, go into prioritizing the repairs or replacement schedules, which can help you as a utility better operate your system. So where does hydraulic modeling sit in, in this whole flushing world, which is primarily very physical, right? When we talk about flushing, we're talking about hands-on operating of valves and hydrants. Where does modeling sit in? Well, modeling can help you fill information gaps to support the implementation of your flushing program. So one of the key, some of the key metrics that really can make or break your flushing program include making sure that you hit the target velocities, making sure that you hit the, the right flow rates, and making sure that you specify the correct fl flushing durations in order to clean your, your areas correctly. And you can do that with a model. You don't need to assume anything. With a model, you can make sure that as you're closing valves and creating sequences, that you're really meeting your velocity, flow direction, flushing duration, and flow rate requirements. And so that's where the model sits in, in this whole very physical, uh, very physical, up, very physical um, flushing activity. When it, when it comes to, you know, 
in indicators of a, of a successful flushing program, the two key things is pr primarily reaching sufficient velocities and sufficient flushing durations. And what, what these go back to is making sure you're scouring and you're removing all the gunk that's in your water main. And also you're suspending everything and then taking it out of your hydrant and not just suspending it and leaving it in the water main. So the key, again, in a nutshell, what you would call a successful flushing program is one that maximizes the successfully cleaned areas, right? You, you definitely don't want to be disturbing areas and not removing that the disturbed stuff from your water mains. And so when, yeah, when we, when we talk about successful flushing, it's maximizing your disturbed and successfully cleaned areas in your water, in your distribution systems. So you might, you might be wondering, we talked a little bit about flushing, what it is, why it's important, and then we compared conventional versus UDF. Hopefully by now from this brief intro, you're convinced that UDF is the right thing for you. Now what comes next is how do I set up my UDF program? Well, there are a few steps that this slide covers. The first one, it, it comes to the actual physical nature of, of our water distribution system. So it's, it starts with assessing your assets, making sure that your your physical assets are actually represented in your model. The second step to that is making sure that your physical assets that are represented in your model are actually operable and that you can locate them, you can access them, and you can exercise them. The next thing in planning when it comes to setting up your UDF program is, is revolves around delineating your flush zones, which is just figuring out which zones you want to tackle first based on your experience uh, with your distribution system. Next, the model is going to come in handy because as we talked about, it's going to allow you to fill in those gaps that you can't just, you know, you can't just easily assume or just make up, right? So you're going to be able to verify your flushing velocities. You're going to be able to establish and develop your uh, flushing sequences. And then finally, you're going to be able to create maps for the operations team to take those maps and use them in the field as they implement the UDF program. And finally, and most fun, just go out to the field after you've done the planning and the modeling and start flushing. And with that, I'm actually gonna transition it to Nathan, who's gonna give us a, a UDF demo using InfoWater Pro. Yeah, thanks Yusuf. Um, I'm actually gonna start off with a poll question. Um, so you should see a poll question now that has popped up. Um, this is just kind of to gauge uh, gauge the audience, um, your your familiarity with uh, with flushing as well as with our software. Um, so this is also my first time. Uh, I'm kind of just curious to see a little bit of also the breakdown between these three, between utility versus consultant. I see a number of people are already voting, so I'll explain the question. Uh, what what describes your usage or familiarity with unidirectional flushing? Are you a utility or consultant? And have you have you used it? Do you, do you currently use it? Or have you used it in different software? Or do you use it in InfoWater Pro or other? Like if you're, I don't know, like one of us and you work for a software company or something like that or decline to answer. Um, so thanks uh, those of you that have answered. Um, yeah, it looks like we do have a good number of people who have not. Um, who have not done UDFs, that's that's helpful for us to know how much of an overview we give. So let's take, I don't know, three more seconds. If you haven't uh, submitted your answer, one, two, three. So I'm gonna end the poll. All right, thanks all who have um, who have uh, submitted answers um, just for for uh, for follow-up. These are these are the answers. Um, so we do have uh, quite a few, um, yeah, 22%. Uh, are, are with utilities that don't do flushing um, or specifically a unidirectional flushing program. We didn't specify if you do general flushing. Um, and there's also a good, uh, the largest number are consultants who have not done flushing analysis. So a good, a good ha uh, handful of newcomers. So uh, happy to see you interested in, in flushing. And there are also some, some uh, consultants that have done uh, flushing. So um, I'm going to, move on from that. And I 
am still sharing my screen. So I'm gonna jump back to the software. Um, so I'm going to give just a, a quick high level demo of, of how InfoWater Pro does unidirectional flushing, just in case you haven't seen the module, you haven't, you haven't been able to interact with it, um, just so you can uh, see, see that, that process and that will kind of give you some context um, after you, under, you now understand why flushing is valuable, why specifically unidirectional flushing is valuable. Um, this is how you set it up. I'll start from actually the end, kind of the, the results, and then I'll, and then I'll step through um, setting up a few sequences uh, from scratch. So um, these are some of the results. It, uh, UDF is now a, a module over here on your ribbon. Um, and I'll also just mention, um, we have actually seen a large uptick in, in customer usage of, of our unidirectional flushing app. Um, so in the past with InfoWater, it was a separate add-on that you had to buy separately. And, and so, and it actually cost a similar price to InfoWater itself, and so it was. It was a. It was kind of you know, a, a significant investment for utilities and consultants that wanted to use that wanted to do flushing analysis. It was a you know, a noticeable add-on. Whereas when we moved to InfoWater Pro from InfoWater, we aimed to simplify things. So we took all of the suite and executive suite features of InfoWater. We just made it all accessible. And then those separate add-on features that you had to buy each one separately, we just made that part of what we call InfoWater Suite. And so now you can just access a lot more of our modules more readily. So uh, with that, um, uh, so with that, we have we've noticed, you know, it could be could be um, just the the greater accessibility of the feature, um, or maybe it's just a, a general trend. But we've definitely seen a lot more people using it. Um, and from that is, was what kind of what motivated some of our work on this feature, as well as uh, the desire to kind of follow up with some tips and tricks um, to the market. So um, that being said, so it's now uh, part of this, this ribbon here. So you can actually just click UDF and you kind of get an alternate tab to this model explorer. So this is your familiar model explorer and this is UDF. Um, and so there's really kind of two main two main uh, launch points. Um, one is setting up your zones, uh, and which I'll come back to. And then the second one is setting up these sequences. And so what I'm going to show you are these sequences where um, we are opening and closing valves and opening hydrants to flush out the water. And so once you have set these up, uh, you'll get a interface that, that, or you'll be able to see things on the map kind of like this. So we can see we're starting from here. So at, uh, at some point you, you have to pick where, um, where you're flushing from. So uh, it could be starting from your larger transmission mains that you wouldn't be able to scour enough anyways. So let's say these are some larger pipes that we're flushing from and we are aiming to flush out this part of the network. So starting in sequence one, um, you can see we close this hydrant and we open, or we close this valve and we open this hydrant and the software will simulate and tell you we're getting exactly 4.3 feet per second. And we have 39.4 uh, residual uh, pressure at that hydrant as we're flushing. And if I um, just kind of move up, we can step through the remaining sequences. And so it will uh, show you on the map. Um, we now open this valve. So we highlight it in green and we close these two valves. Um, and in this case, we're actually opening up two hydrants. Uh, that's something that you can do when you want to uh, aim to get more velocity out of, like if these are slightly larger pipes and you just don't quite get the scour, sometimes opening additional hydrants will give you higher, higher velocities um, through those pipes. But yeah, so each sequence, um, you can see it will show you uh, which valves you're opening, which valves you're closing, what the velocities are, it highlights which pipes you've already cleaned and which pipes you're actively cleaning. Um, and so then you can review through all of those results. Um, and uh, it's just taking a, taking a second for my map to update. Um, you'll also notice, uh, and this may be new to some users, we'll show this uh, in detail in the tips and tricks, but 
Uh, this, uh, we, you can also differentiate, this is the valve that we're closing in this sequence. And then there's these two orange valves. These are valves that were previously closed. So they're still closed, so don't forget them, but you don't have to do anything active on them in this sequence. So you re we really have four different statuses of valves. One are my base map layer um, yellow valves. Uh, and you can, you know, you could of course set up this, these colors however you want. Um, but I just have my background valves as yellow. So these are normally always open. And then if, if it's green, that means in this active sequence, we are, our crews need to ac actively open it. Red means they're closing it. And orange means it is still closed from before, but we don't have to do anything to it now. Um, and so, so yeah, you can step through all of those sequences. And, um, and then what you get is uh, all of the hydraulic data um, for, for all of these. So if I step into my sequence manager, um, you can see for any sequence, these are the target pipes. These are the valves that we are opening and closing. This is my hydrant. And then the rest is results. So you can see exactly um, all of these numerical results from the simulation. Um, you can see uh, for your flushing pipes, what kind of velocity and shear stress you're achieving. Um, you can spot any junctions that are below your, your threshold critical pressure. Um, so this is really helpful when you're running the sequences. If you can know, you can learn if there are going to be adverse impacts on your network. Um, you can also see if there's going to be high pressure junctions. I don't imagine that happens too often, as well as high high velocity pipes and so on. Um, and so this this gives you all those hydraulic results. Um, you can also push all this out to Excel, uh, where you can summarize and um, you know further manipulate the data um, out in Excel. Um, but essentially, yeah, that, that is the process, is that you can set up these um, sequences. You can zoom to an active sequence, uh, run it. You can run them all in batch, and that is the process. And so once you have, once you're at this point where you have all these sequences ready in the model, you've evaluated them, you have uh, you know, signed off on them as the, as the, the modeling engineer, uh, then what you do is you... Uh, use this drop down menu and you go to print field journal. And this will actually pop up um, a tool where you can um, further kind of uh, control some of the design of, of how it will go out to a field journal. But I'm just gonna bring up the final uh, result, which is a PDF, which I see I haven't opened in a little while. So my OneDrive has uh, <laughs> offloaded it to the cloud. Um, so I just re-downloaded it. So um, this is what it will uh, give you. Um, there's, there's a few different options. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this on how you can customize this in the different formats that you have, you have accessible. But a common way is to generate a PDF. And so um, this is what you could then uh, have your crews print off and take out to the field. So this will have each individual sequence gets uh, a page in the PDF and it will tell you exactly um, which valves to open, close, pipes that you're flushing, which hydrant you're opening, as well as the actual duration of how long to flush. And so this, this kind of gets, um, gets back to that success criteria that you're uh, scouring the pipes, but also then removing all of that, that you know, undesirable water um, out of those pipes. Um, and so these are the model results. And um, if you want, you can also then um, submit your field measurements um, as you're actually doing the work in the field uh, in terms of the hydraulic data as well as water quality data. If you have um, you know, turbidity, initial, final, um, these can be useful information to feed back um, into your system for, for learning and so on. Um, so that, that's, that's one of the, the, the end takeaway points. Um, and I'm going to just uh, go ahead and um, let's see, I'm keeping an eye on the time. I'm going to just for yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to start off, I'm going to demo um, what, what it looks like to just do this from scratch. So I'm going to create a new zone uh, called demo. Uh, and in here, you can define some of your, your base criteria. Um, what is your, your uh, desired flushing velocity, et cetera. I'm going to skip past most of those um, because what I want to focus on is actually the um, setting up of sequences. And so this this is uh, the process where you can define um, what, you're, what you're going to do. So you create a new sequence 
And for each sequence, you need to know what target pipes there are. So I'm going to just say select. Um, oh, I changed my selection approach. So I can just, um, so, so I select these two pipes, um, right click enter. Whoops, um, let me clear that and do that again. So just have uh, those two pipes. Um, so those are in, you can always double check and say highlight, highlight pipes. Um, so, um, so we're just looking for some IDs there. Uh, and then for the operations, um, you can uh, choose. And so in this case, I want to flush out from here up to this hydrant. So visually I can see what naturally I want to do. Uh, so you just need the pipes, the valves, the hydrant, and then uh, once you're ready, you can then click to uh, run that sequence. And that should simulate and then show my results on the map right away. Um, and the valve should also show up in a second. Uh, my map is refreshing. Um, there we go. So that, so that, is, that is sequence one. Um, there are some tools that will help you automate a little bit more. So I'm going to do my next sequence called sequence two naturally. Um, I'll select the pipes. I'll grab that one and that one for those two. Enter. Um, you could also you know, select a path. Um, you can always highlight just to verify. So basically, I'm going out to this hydrant. And in this case, um, let's say uh, I want the software to tell me which valves to open and close. Um, so to do that, uh, you just need the, the pipes that you're trying to target, and you also need your hydrant. So once I select the hydrant, I'm going to let the software fill in this table. So that's going to be this icon here. So if I click that, um, it has correctly identified that I want to now open um, valve 87, and I want to close this valve, which uh, isn't showing me the label on the map right now. But um, let's go ahead and run it and trust, <laughs> see if it got it right. Um, so that's going to simulate now and then update my map um, with those additional layers on top. Yep, looks like it got it correct. Um, so that so that is the process. Um, uh, so it it is not an automated tool that will figure out the optimized um, uh, flushing sequences in every way. Uh, it does still involve engineering judgment and involvement on how to set up the sequences. And um, speaking from, from people who have experience in this, it is something that is sort of, uh, sort of an art. There's no exact right or wrong way to do it, but it is a skill that grows with practice. So I've heard experienced modelers say, um, just practice setting up these sequences. Um, the more the more of these sequences you set up, the the faster and more efficient you get at it in terms of identifying the most efficient routes. Um, but yeah, that is the tool. And then once these sequences are in place, you know you can batch rerun, um, control, manipulate the data, see all the hydraulic results, um, and then push it out to the field journal. So uh, that that is the the tool and the values that once you have set up all these sequences, it could be a part of a reoccurring program where you know you are flushing out different parts of your system, um, you know each each year uh, to you know to achieve the the, the type of water quality um, targets that you have in your system, and so that uh, summarizes the high level demo. Um, let's see, uh, as I hand it over to. I, as as I transition over, let, let me just pause and see. Are there any questions? Um, and I'll uh, yeah, I haven't had a chance to read. So yeah, Yusuf, do you want to call out any questions? Yeah, one that, one of the recurring questions was about how customizable the field reports were. Yes, um, yes, they are customizable, and I think that will be that will best fit with Susanna's topic. So mm -hmm. let's come back to that one in terms of those field mm -hmm. reports. That's a good that's a good question. Um, Yes, and I see I see font size. Uh, very good. We'll come back to those. Um, I also see uh, what is naturally a, a little bit of a feature request, which I'm happy to see. Um, so so yes, I, I I'm always uh, working with the, the development team and and working on our roadmap in terms of what features we we prioritize and we work on. Um, I see I see a <laughs> sort of a feature request that. Um, someone is, is pointing out printed a paper for flushing crews to fill out, we would really prefer a web map and form. Um, I totally, totally can agree with you. So 
um, that is something we are considering in the future. So uh, yeah, if anyone else wants to call out feature requests, um, maybe in the chat to me could be a good place, um, but I'm always always happy to take, take, uh, take the feedback. Um, uh, Yusuf, have you spotted a, a, any others that would be best to address now, or we could always wait till later? One of them, uh, one of them was just asking about the symbology for uh, valves that remain closed. That would that would just be through the table of contents, right? Yeah, um, yeah. That's actually one of our tips and tricks that we're going to get to in a minute. But I'll go ahead and show it since it is is a question now. Um, so uh, th there's within UDF, um, you know, you've got this. This is this brings up the the window. The more is is the main drop down of all the different options. And then there's this kind of hidden options over here uh, that not all users notice. Um, we've actually since uh, in, in the next version, the options are going to show up down here as well, so you won't miss it. But if you go to options and then you go to symbols, uh, this is not currently the default behavior. But what you can do is you can assign valve highlighting color as orange, and then you check this box to differentiate the highlight the closing valves with a different color. And so I use red for that, and then um, orange for valves that were closed and they're, but they're not being acted on. So this is, uh, this is one of our tips that we're gonna show later. Um, and this is actually something we're looking to make as a default within the software. So in new versions, this will be, um, this will, be, uh, this will just happen naturally, but if you're still using an older version, um, this is something you can totally do yourself um, if you want. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. You just opened up these these options here, and you should be able to find it. Um, all right. Um, I am going to start to transition over to Susanna, and and I'll keep an eye on on the questions, and I and and we can um, type in some answers as we go, and then we'll we'll have time to go back to back to the questions. I don't want to. Um, derail uh, the, the content we we're hoping to go through. Um, so uh, as I transition over to, um, over to the new tool, um, uh, I want to mention that um, as you start setting up unidirectional flushing, um, you actually have two different, uh, two different options. Um, uh, whoops. Uh, sorry, it's... Um, uh, I'm actually suddenly drawing, <laughs> I'm actually suddenly drawing a, a blank, um, on, yeah, let me, let me, let me actually open up a, a slide, uh, sorry about this. We're going to transition back to, to PowerPoint. Um, but, uh, one of the, the things that you'll, you'll encounter is that when you're setting up, um, yeah, yeah. When you're setting up your your valves and and hydrants, is that you you will either be using an external layer like a GIS layer, or you could be using internal elements within the model. Um, so, and and so you have to choose either one. And there are some trade offs. And in general, we've we've always uh, recommended the GIS layer approach. Um, just because that can be streamlined. Usually customers will have uh, a, a layer of GIS valves that can uh, be used to close, uh, close things in the model. And usually those valves are not in the model directly. And in the past, when this, when this feature was first developed uh, years ago, um, <laughs> a lot of modelers were a little bit simpler than the GIS. And so oftentimes pipes would go through these unnecessarily valves. And then we would uh, we actually just virtually split the pipes where the valves occur. However, one of the trends we've seen in the industry is that more often than not, models are now being built based on um, all of the GIS pipe features, sort of like a one-to-one -one model to GIS relationship. And what that ends up meaning is that you have valves that sit on top of junctions. And so the valve is exactly at the, the, the pipe endpoints. And um, we've had support teams, you know, recommend that you know this this isn't the best approach um, to to doing that. So you know, you could use model elements instead, in which there are junctions or valves. Um, unfortunately, you can't do junctions and valves at the same time. Uh, but this also just has has limitations. If you had to set up 
your junctions and, and valves. Um, there's limitations like if you use a junction, but if that junction has demand, it will cause problems in the engine because um, if the junction suddenly becomes a valve and we're closing it, 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 yeah, it just won't work in that way. So what we have um, decided going forward, uh, both, uh, both methods are fully supported as before, but we, we believe that the GIS approach is, is going to be the preferred approach for most, most, cust most users. And so we've, we've added now a tool that will help um, improve that GIS association, especially where you have valves that are on top of junctions. Um, and so that's what I'm at. Um, so that, that's kind of setting the stage uh, for Susanna is that the assumption is that most users will, be, will have a GIS layer and we, we now want tools within the software that help you come up with a robust association between those valves and your actual model pipes and operations. So um, with that, uh, Susanna, do you wanna um, take the screen sharing over from here? Uh, yes. Are you able yes. to do that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'll go ahead and just um, show one slide uh, related to this. Um, Nathan, does it look good on your side? Um, I don't see anything. One second. Oh. Uh, no, I don't see your screen. Uh, sorry, sure you forgot to share. press one more button. Okay, let's try that again. Yeah, yeah, your uh, yeah, your screen is really vertical. <laughs> mm. Does that makes sense. Yeah, let me try it again. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Do you have a wide monitor? Uh, yeah, two monitors. Oh. Sorry, I apologize, I... audience. For this. Yeah, I apologize. To the no, no. Do you uh, just quick, quickly show a slide for me, please? Yeah, and then I'll yep, move over totally. to the. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, sorry, I'm getting back to Zoom. All right, so I believe I'm sharing my screen again. Yeah, if you could just share that one. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, so we have um, a new feature. Uh, it's called the UDS Data QA QC tool. And the purpose of this feature is to help us identify issues with external U UDS um, GIS elements, uh, particularly those that Nathan was mentioning where you might have um, conflicting GS external layers with those within the model itself. Uh, so the, the tool itself will evaluate a couple of things, uh, including unusual data such as lateral length that's incorrect, elevations that are equal to zero, or other unusual input data. It, it will flag it for you. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will correct it or it will prevent you from trying to run the model, but it will definitely um, provide that information. Um, it will also flag if there's a special reference that is um, different from uh, maybe the model one. So ideally the model requires you to have the same spatial reference for your in-model elements and also for your GIS external elements that represent the valves in the hydrant. Um, any, uh, it will verify that all hydrants are associated with pipe elements, that all valves are associated with pipe elements. Um, if there's invalid or missing IDs for valve and hydrant elements, and uh, the most um, intentional was if there are conflicting UDS elements against hydraulic, uh, the in model uh, junction to be precise or, um, or other item. So that being said, I will go ahead and uh, show you what that feature looks like in the model itself. So I'll go ahead and take control, Nathan, or take uh, over the screen. Okay. And move to the side. <laughs> okay, so when setting up uh, the UDS model, as Nathan mentioned, the first step would be to set the layer. Uh, this is also a prerequisite for running the UDS QA QC tool. So you would go ahead and identify your external hydrant um, element and also your uh, valve hydrant element. So I have these set, and then you would also identify what is your unique ID field. So I have SHID uh, and VAL ID. So now I can go ahead and run the QAQC tool. 
and it will go ahead and report in the message board all the records that have invalid or incorrect uh, valid um, IDs. So um, that's one way to see that. Go ahead and clear that for purposes of that. So I'll go ahead and correct that and set the correct fire hydrant and valve ID. And uh, run the QAQC tool. And now it's only informing me that there are two invalid valve connections. Now this information may or may not be true. This also depends on the information that is stored within the edit, uh, the uh, hydrant attribute table and the valve attribute table. So I'll go ahead and take a look at the hydrant attribute table. And if you expand it, um, you'll scroll to the rightmost of the table and you'll be able to see um, some information in here. So, um, this is the pipe to the distance, the nearest node ID and distance to node. And actually this information is shifted. So I have reported this to our uh, developers. So this will get corrected prior to release. Uh, if anybody noticed it, I did, I, I did catch it. <laughs> um, but the edit valve table is looking a little better. So I'll show that one instead. Um, so you will be able to see what is the ID of the nearest node. Uh, the distance to the node and the number of pipes that are connected. Now, the reason why we're providing this information is because there are uh, essentially three types of, um, of issues that you may run into when, uh, when you have conflicting issues. You may have an issue where you have two pipes that are connected to a junction and the valve is sitting within that junction. This is not necessarily an issue, the UDF application will still be able to run the simulation for you. Nevertheless, um, it might be something that'd be worthwhile to look at. Now, if you have three or more pipes connected to a junction where there is a conflicting valve, um, we will have some issues with the application and you will have either incorrect results or the UEF application will provide you with a failed, um, with a failed solution. Um, so, uh, I guess one key point too, how these tables get populated is by operating the auto-associate hydrant and the auto-associate valve. So I'll go ahead and run the auto-associate valve tool. And then I'll run the QAQC tool as well. And so I, I have run this before, so I have the same sort of results. So we have a couple of invalid valve connections and hydrant locations. Um, so the reason why I wanted to point out the auto-associate valve or the auto-associate hydrant is because we have this value called the searching distance. Now, the way that the um, QAQC tool identifies which uh, valves are a little bit too close to a junction within the model is based on the associated uh, valve or hydrant to, that, uh, to the model, to the pipe and also the, uh, the searching distance. So to, that is specific to the connectivity tool or the QAQC tool. So if you go to preferences under the InfoWater Pro ribbon and you go to the display setting, we have this setting called the minimum search distance. The minimum search distance should be equal to or less to that uh, connectivity tool in order for the application to flag uh, proper incorrect or conflict with the, with the application. Uh, the reason why we have this uh, feature or this setting within the preferences tool is because we have a similar feature in development um, for another one of our extension. So in the future, we would have this same setting applicable to, multiple, to more than just the UDF app. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at to what, um, as to why this is an invalid connection. Um, so to, um, to search for uh, these items, my preferred method is to actually go directly into the GIS data. So in this case, it's the hydrogen valve uh, um, table. Go to the attribute table and identify where this is located. So I'm using valid ID. I'm going to paste that and then I'll go ahead and zoom to that location. 
So as you can see, um, let me make this a little bit bigger. That's probably plenty. From, uh, from a far away view, you can kind of see that the uh, valve is uh, kind of sitting on top of the, of the junction. As you zoom in closer, you will notice that it's actually off to the side. But the question is whether this valve should be allocated or should be associated to this pipe or to this pipe and to which one it should be closed. So having this uh, QAQC tool will help us identify those issues and be able to, if you have the capability um, to edit your GIS, you can go ahead and do that now or simply uh, have the UDF tool properly uh, assigned to the proper pipe. So automatically this was associated to pipe 252. Pipe 252 is this one right here, but perhaps the proper location for, or the pipe that this double actually goes is pipe 256. So we can use the software then to um, assign a different pipe ID. And now the pipe ID is 256. So this valve will close this pipe and it will break the pipe um, in the approximate location where it was allocated. Um, another one uh, that you might be able to see is when you have invalid hydrant location. So we'll go ahead and find a hydrant as well and um, prefer this method as well. Okay, so also from, you know, from this zoom extent, you can see that the hydrant is sitting right on top of, um, of a junction. Um, for the purposes of running the model, you can still be able to run the model uh, or be able to run your sequence if the hydrant is sitting on top of this. But the issue with this is that if we take a look at the attribute table for this, uh, for this hydrant, um, we can see that the distance to the pipe, um, it's actually should be zero. <laughs> so this should be shifted but over. So I, I apologize for that, but uh, it's zero. Now, the problem with that distance is that um, we are not accounting for any of the losses from the lateral um, or any minor losses due to the length of the lateral. Um, so that might give you some incorrect or invalid results. Um, also, it, um, if flushing out of this pipe or this hydrant, you'll want to identify that you're flushing in the proper location. So you have the correct um, valve settings um, to, to flush out of this. So it's, um, it's a way of letting you know as the, as the model or where, which areas you might want to verify for proper use. Um, so in this case, um, yeah, so the lateral length is uh, showing up here. Um, okay, so anyway, just to recap the use of the QAQC tool, uh, in order to be able to run it, uh, first identify your external layers and the proper ID field. Um, if your hydrant and attribute table, hydrant and valve attribute tables are empty, then also as auto-associate hydrant and auto-associate valve. And then you can go ahead and run the QAQC tool. And to evaluate the results, you can look at the message board. You can look at the valve element itself and see uh, which items are, you know, are correlated to that issue. Or you can also open the edit hydrant and edit valve attribute tables and look at the results for those items. Um, okay. so. Um, moving onward, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the common uh, questions that we get with regards to UDF uh, setting up Info uh, UDF within InfoWater Pro. Um, so one of those questions is regards to the UDF field journal customization. So in this case, I have um, a zone that has already been identified. So I'll go ahead and turn off my flush zones. And let me see, how many do I have in here? That's two, one zone, okay. 
Um, so a zone typically is the space or the section within the water network that you want to flush within a period of time. You may target it as a as the space that you want to flush within one day. You may target it as a space that you want to flush within the week. It kind of depends on um, on some questions or some needs that your utility has. So within uh, within Innovise, our rule of thumb is typically to keep a flush zone within about a thousand feet of pipe, give or take. Um, so we typically evaluate, okay, these, this area is about a thousand feet of pipe, this area is about a thousand feet of pipe, and we can start kind of ballparking more or less where we want to locate um, the flush zone. Uh, the other thing that is important to identify is where is going to be the source, the, the first uh, clean source that I want to start flushing out of. These are typically uh, reservoirs, pump stations, or even a large uh, diameter water pipe, which is essentially where you want to start flushing. Um, some other things that you want to consider is what are the physical um, limitations within uh, you know, within my city, within the area that I want to flush. So you can use subdivisions as a way of identifying which, uh, which area flows as one flush zone. You can also look at streets. So if there are busy streets or highways, you probably want to stay within that area so that when the operators go into the field to start flushing, they don't have to get on the highway, off the highway, on the highway, maybe see if you can figure out a way of Kind of maneuvering around those locations. So there's just a lot of planning that needs to go into place prior to actually defining your sequences and defining uh, your flush zones. It's, you know, kind of what are the needs, what does the city where this is going to take place look like, and what are going to be some of the problems. So this, this takes a little bit of brainstorming, a little bit of communication, and establishing what are going to be your priorities um, and, and, uh, and planning it about that way. Now, when you, within Innovites, we typically just digitize the polygons that represent the flush zones using InfoWater or ArcGIS Pro, my apologies, and, and just digitizing the polygons around the area. Uh, typically, you digitize the polygons so that you uh, end at the location so that it fully includes the pipe and, um, and it ends at the junction so that this is going to be the beginning of a new flush zone. Um, so anyway, let me see. Are there any questions uh, you said regarding two flush zones that I can answer right now while I'm on this point? Nothing that I'm seeing right now, but if anyone has any questions, please type in and type them in the Q and A tab and we're going to address them. Okay. Yeah, great. actually, um, actually Susanna, uh, so I think we, we do have five minutes left and uh, a hot topic has definitely been the, the field report customization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'll move on to that one right away. Okay. So within the um, the more dropdown in UDF, we have the print field journal. And uh, when once we launch this uh, this feature, you can see that you can start you can define the range of sequences that you want to print. They can do from one to twenty four. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to do twenty three and twenty four. And um, I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So it's going to go ahead and print out or generate. Um, uh, the sequences. As you can so see, the map flashes that so identifies the locations where the um, the application automatically zoomed in order to include the flush sequence. Uh, so as of right now, we still have just our standard run-of-the-mill PDF. Uh, if you go to the file drop-down menu, we have an export document where we can go ahead and export to a Word document by using the export to uh, RTS. Oops. Uh, oh, I have it open, sorry. So I printed this earlier when I was testing it out. And this is a completely editable document at this point. Um, so you have some flexibility to edit through Word if, if that's your, uh, your preference. Uh, you can also export to Excel. And you would also have the ability to edit your map through Excel. And um, it's not quite uh, a template. Well, I guess it is, it is a template. It's essentially 
printing out the template from InfoWater Pro. And from here, you have your typical um, Excel features to help you modify and adjust the map area. Um, so this is what we have implemented with regards to abilities to customize the, um, the print field journal. Um, kind of along those lines as well, if you go to the sequence manager, you'll notice the section that says zoom to extent or, you, or where you can define the extent of the sequence data or users defined data. So if you're not quite happy with uh, the picture that InfoWater Pro took of your sequence, you can uh, go ahead and um, zoom to the extent that you want. So for example, if I don't want to include the streets, so in this case, maybe this is the extent oh, of the map that I have. So it's a bit too far off. Maybe I want to zoom in a little bit more. I can go ahead and zoom. You users define visible extent, or I can also define. And now when I uh, print, when I print from the field journal, sequence 24, it will zoom, as you can see, it will zoom to that area that I, I precisely uh, asked the application to print. So those are some customization uh, features that we have within the application to help you, um, yeah, to help you define what, what is in there. Um, any, other, uh, any other questions that are, I know we're kind of close on time right now, that I should try to tackle in the next two minutes. Yeah, uh, let me, <laughs> I seem to have lost. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, is there a way to adjust the, the field journal such that symbol size in the legend matches the size of the symbol in the overview map of the flush sequence? So can you control mapped symbol size in any way? Um, is it referring to the InfoWater Pro symbol size? Yeah, I believe. It so that the, the field journal map matches what you see within the map in Infowater Pro. Um, um, yeah, so, so the symbology in Infowater Pro uh, field journals is kind of set so to only show the closed valves and the open valves and also, you know, what is flushed. Um, I wonder, I'm not entirely sure, but I wonder if you do increase the size within the table of contents. I believe it will actually be reflected in the field journal when you print it. Um, but I would have to double check on that. I'm not entirely sure. So that I think that's something that's worth trying. Um, mm -hmm. so let's see. Yes, yeah, so it does increase the because it does print whatever is in the map area. It just kind of squishes it so that it fits within the map area. Um, so even if let's say we increase the letter size of this. Yeah, um, that was a question. Someone asked, uh, can you print 11 by 17 pages as well? And customize those? Uh, yeah, yeah, you should be able to. So I think I, my preferred method of printing is typically landscape. And I know in InfoWater, I think you, this is a little bit more concise, but um, let me see if we can do it within the the other window. Oops, I printed the whole thing. Sorry. Um, I owe you that question. If you could submit a question through the support portal, um, we should be able to investigate this properly and give you a more of uh, a better walkthrough. Um, I just kind of killed the last second I had to answer that question by printing the whole field journal. <laughs> um, so I do apologize for that, but I do believe that we can modify that either through this window or the one that comes after you confirm. Uh, that you want to print the, the field journal. Yeah, and also, that was like saying, the, yeah? yeah. It seems like the final three questions address really the customizability of the field reports. And these are things that we're going we're gonna to be able to get, get back to you after we end the webinar through email uh, to answer your questions. But we're right at the one o'clock mark. And you know we really appreciate everyone attending. And thank you so much. And this can be something that we start and we continue another series or another Water talk also revol revolving around UDF. So, uh, Nathan and Susanna, any any final words before we wrap up here? Uh, no, I'm just very happy with the uh, with the amount of attendees and interest 
And yeah, I also with the amount of questions, I wish we had allocated more time for that at this time. But um, it's also I think it opens up opportunity for other for other water talks where we can expand on other talk, talk, topics such as the print field journal. Right. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Happy to. Uh, uh, it sounds like sounds like from the the questions that it might we might benefit from uh, creating like a blog post um, knowledge base article on UDF uh, field journal customization to just kind of create one holistic topic. Um, sounds like seems like that might be beneficial. So really useful. I'm um, just yeah seeing all the questions. So thanks for thanks for showing up and engaging. Um, always always a <laughs> always fun to to get into those. Yeah, and thank you for reacting with us and engaging with us. And we'll keep in touch with you. And the un un unanswered questions, we'll get back to you via email and we are going to address your questions. But once again, thank you from you know the team and thank you for attending and have a great day, everyone.